Chapter 8 Mrs. Jennings was a widow with an ample jointure. She had only two daughters, both of whom she had lived to see respectably married, and she had now therefore nothing to do but to marry all the rest of the world. In the promotion of this object she was zealously active, as far as her ability reached, and missed no opportunity of projecting weddings amongst all the young people of her acquaintance. She was remarkably quick in the discovery of attachments, and had enjoyed the advantage of raising the blushes and the vanity of many a young lady by insinuations of her power over such a young man, and this kind of discernment enabled her soon after her arrival at Barton decisively to pronounce that Colonel Brandon was very much in love with Marianne Dashwood. She rather suspected it to be so on the very first evening of their being together, from his listening so attentively while she sang to him, and when the visit was returned by the Middletons dining at the cottage, the fact was ascertained by his listening to her again. It must be so. She was perfectly convinced of it. It would be an excellent match, for he was rich and she was handsome. Mrs. Jennings had been anxious to see Colonel Brandon well married ever since her connection with Sir John first brought him to her knowledge and she was always anxious to get a good husband for every pretty girl. The immediate advantage to herself was by no means inconsiderable, for it supplied her with endless jokes against them both. At the park she laughed at the colonel, and in the cottage at Mary Ann. To the former her raillery was probably, as far as it regarded only himself, perfectly indifferent, but to the latter it was at first incomprehensible and when its object was understood she hardly knew whether most to laugh at its absurdity or censure its impertinence, for she considered it as an unfeeling reflection on the colonel's advanced years and on his forlorn condition as an old bachelor. Mrs. Dashwood, who could not think a man five years younger than herself, so exceedingly ancient as he appeared to the youthful fancy of her daughter, ventured to clear Mrs. Jennings from the probability of wishing to throw ridicule on his age. But at least, Mamma, you cannot deny the absurdity of the accusation, though you may not think it intentionally ill-natured. Colonel Brandon is certainly younger than Mrs. Jennings, but he is old enough to be my father, and if he were ever animated enough to be in love, must have long outlived every sensation of the kind. It is too ridiculous. When is a man to be saved from such wit, if age and infirmity will not protect him? Infirmity? said Eleanor. Do you call Colonel Brandon infirm? I can easily suppose that his age may appear much greater to you than to my mother, but you can hardly deceive yourself as to his having the use of his limbs. Did not you hear him complain of the rheumatism? And is not that the commonest infirmity of declining life? My dearest child, said her mother, laughing, at this rate you must be in continual terror of my decay, and it must seem to you a miracle that my life has been extended to the advanced age of forty. Mamma. You're not doing me justice. I know very well that Colonel Brandon is not old enough to make his friends yet apprehensive of losing him in the course of nature. He may live twenty years longer, but thirty-five has nothing to do with matrimony. Perhaps, said Eleanor, thirty-five and seventeen had better not have anything to do with matrimony together, but if there should be any chance happen to be a woman who is single at seven and twenty, I should not think Colonel Brandon's being thirty-five any objection to his marrying her. A woman of seven and twenty, said Marianne after pausing a moment, can never hope to feel or inspire affection again, and if her home be uncomfortable or her fortune small, I can suppose that she might bring herself to submit to the offices of a nurse for the sake of the provision and security of a wife. In his marrying such a woman, therefore, there would be nothing unsuitable. It would be a compact of convenience, and the world would be satisfied. In my eyes it would be no marriage at all, but that would be nothing. To me it would seem only a commercial exchange in which each wished to be benefited at the expense of the other. It would be impossible, I know, replied Eleanor, to convince you that a woman of seven and twenty could feel for a man of thirty-five anything near enough to love to make him a desirable companion to her. But I must object to your dooming Colonel Brandon and his wife to the constant confinement of a sick chamber, merely because he chanced to complain yesterday, a very cold, damp day, of a slight rheumatic feel in one of his shoulders. 
But he talked of flannel waistcoats, said Marianne, and with me a flannel waistcoat is invariably connected with aches, cramps, rheumatisms, and every species of ailment that can inflict the old and the feeble. Had he been only in a violent fever, you would not have despised him half so much. Confess, Marianne, is not there something interesting to you in the flushed cheek, hollow eye, and quick pulse of a fever? Soon after this, upon Eleanor's leaving the room, Mamma, said Marianne, I have an alarm on the subject of illness which I cannot conceal from you. I am sure Edward Ferrars is not well. We have now been here almost a fortnight, and yet it has not come. Nothing but real indisposition could occasion this extraordinary delay. What else can detain him at Norland? Had you any eye of his coming so soon? said Mrs. Dashwood. I had none. On the contrary, if I have felt any anxiety at all on the subject, it has been in recollecting that he sometimes showed a want of pleasure and readiness in accepting my invitation when I talked of his coming to pardon. Does Eleanor expect him already? I have never mentioned it to her, but of course she must. I rather think you're mistaken. When I was talking to her yesterday of getting a new grate for the spare bedchamber, she observed that there was no immediate hurry for it as it was not likely that the room would be wanted for some time. How strange this is! What can be the meaning of it? But the whole of the behavior to each other has been unaccountable. How cold! How composed were their last adieus! How languid their conversation the last evening of their being together! In Edward's farewell there was no distinction between Eleanor and me. It was the good wishes of an affectionate brother to both. Twice did I leave them purposely together in the course of the last morning, and each time did he most unaccountably follow me out of the room. And Eleanor, in quitting Norland and Edward, cried not as I did. Even now her self-command is invariable. When is she dejected or melancholy? When does she try to avoid society, or appear restless and dissatisfied in it? Chapter 9 the Dashwoods were now settled at Barton with tolerable comfort to themselves. The house and the garden, with all the objects surrounding them, were now become familiar, and the ordinary pursuits which had given to Norland half its charms were engaging again with far greater enjoyment than Norland had been able to afford since the loss of their father. Sir John Middleton, who called on them every day for the first fortnight, and who was not in the habit of seeing much occupation at home, could not conceal his amazement on finding them always employed. Their visitors, except those from Barton Park, were not many, for in spite of Sir John's urgent entreaties that they would mix more in the neighborhood, and repeated assurances of his carriage being always at their service, the independence of Mrs. Dashwood's spirit overcame the wish of society for her children, and she was resolute in declining to visit any family beyond the distance of a walk. There were but few who could be so classed, and it was not all of them that were attainable. About a mile and a half from the cottage, along the narrow, winding valley of Hellenham, which issued from that of Barton, as formerly described, the girls had, in one of their earliest walks, discovered an ancient, respectable-looking mansion which, by reminding them a little of Norland, interested their imagination and made them wish to be better acquainted with it. But they learned on inquiry that its possessor, an elderly lady of very good character, was unfortunately too infirm to mix with the world and never stirred from home. The whole country about them abounded in beautiful walks, the high downs which invited them from almost every window of the cottage to seek the exquisite enjoyment of air on their summits were a happy alternative when the dirt of the valleys beneath shut up their superior beauties, and towards one of these hills did Marianne and Margaret one memorable morning direct their steps, attracted by the partial sunshine of a showery sky and unable longer to bear the confinement which the settled rain of the two preceding days had occasioned. The weather was not tempting enough to draw the two others from their pencil and their book, in spite of Marianne's declaration that the day would be lastingly fair, and that every threatening cloud would be drawn off from their hills, 
and the two girls set off together. They gaily ascended the downs, rejoicing in their own penetration at every glimpse of blue sky, and when they caught in their faces the animating gales of a high southwesterly wind, they pitied the fears which had prevented their mother and Eleanor from sharing such delightful sensations. Is there felicity in the world, said Marianne, superior to this? Margaret, we'll walk here at least two hours. Margaret agreed, and they pursued their way against the wind, resisting it with laughing delight for about twenty minutes longer, when suddenly the clouds united over their heads, and a driving rain sat full in their face. Chagrined and surprised, they were obliged, though unwillingly, to turn back, for no shelter was nearer than their own house. One consolation, however, remained for them, to which the exigence of the moment gave more than usual propriety. It was that of running with all possible speed down the steep side of the hill, which led immediately to their garden gate. They set off. Marianne had at first the advantage, but a false step brought her suddenly to the ground, and Margaret, unable to stop herself to assist her, was involuntarily hurried along and reached the bottom in safety. A gentleman carrying a gun with two pointers playing round him was passing up the hill and within a few yards of Marianne when her accident happened. He put down his gun and ran to her assistance. She had raised herself from the ground, but her foot had been twisted in her fall, and she was scarcely able to stand. The gentleman offered his services, and perceiving that her modesty declared what her situation rendered necessary, took her up in his arms without farther delay, and carried her down the hill. Then, passing through the garden, the gate of which had been left open by Margaret, he bore her directly into the house, whither Margaret had just arrived, and quitted not his hold till he had seated her in a chair in the parlour. Eleanor and her mother rose up in amazement at their entrance, and the eyes of both were fixed on him with an evident wonder and a secret admiration which equally sprung from his appearance. He apologized for his intrusion by relating its cause in a manner so frank and so graceful that his person, which was uncommonly handsome, received additional charms from his voice and expression. Had he been even old, ugly, and vulgar, the gratitude and kindness of Mrs. Dashwood would have been secured by any act of attention to her child, but the influence of youth, beauty, and elegance gave an interest to the action which came home to her feelings. She thanked him again, and again, and with the sweetness of address which always attended her, invited him to be seated. But this he declined as he was dirty and wet. Mrs. Dashwood then begged to know to whom she was obliged. His name, he replied, was Willoughby, and his present home was at Allenham, from whence he hoped she would allow him the honour of calling to-morrow to inquire after Miss Dashwood. The honour was readily granted, and he then departed to make himself still more interesting in the midst of a heavy rain. His manly beauty and more than common gracefulness were instantly the theme of general admiration, and the laugh which his gallantry raised against Marianne received particular spirit from his exterior attractions. Marianne herself had seen less of his person than the rest, for the confusion which crimsoned over her face on his lifting her up had robbed her of the power of regarding him after their entering their house. But she had seen enough of him to join in all the admiration of the others, and with an energy which always adorned her praise. His person and air were equal to what her fancy had ever drawn for the hero of a favorite story, and in his carrying her into the house with so little previous formality there was a rapidity of thought which particularly recommended the action to her. Every circumstance belonging to him was interesting. His name was good, his residence was in their favored village, and she soon found out that of all manly dresses a shooting jacket was the most becoming. Her imagination was busy, her reflections were pleasant, and the pain of a sprained ankle was disregarded. Sir John called on them as soon as the next interval of fair weather that morning allowed him to get out of doors.
and Marianne's accident being related to him, he was eagerly asked whether he knew any gentleman of the name of Willoughby at Ellenham. Willoughby? cried Sir John. What? Is he in the country? That is good news. I'll ride over tomorrow and ask him to dinner on Thursday. You know him, then, said Mrs. Dashwood. Know him, to be sure I do. Why, he is down here every year. And what sort of a young man is he? As good a kind of fellow as ever lived, I assure you. A very decent shot, and there's not a bolder rider in England. And is that all you can say for him? cried Marianne indignantly. For what are his manners on more intimate acquaintance? What his pursuits, his talents, and genius? Sir John was rather puzzled. Upon my soul, said he, I do not know much about him as to all that. But he is a pleasant, good-humoured fellow, and has got the nicest little black bitch of a pointer I ever saw. Was she out with him today? But Marianne could no more satisfy him as to the colour of Mr. Willoughby's pointer than he could describe to her the shades of his mind. But who is he? said Eleanor. Where does he come from? Has he a house at Allenham? On this point Sir John could give more certain intelligence, and he told them that Mr. Willoughby had no property of his own in the country, that he resided there only while he was visiting the old lady at Allenham Court, to whom he was related, and whose possessions he was to inherit, adding, Yes, yes, he is very well worth catching, I can tell you, Miss Stashwood, he has a pretty little estate of his own in Somersetshire. Besides, and if I were you, I would not give him up to my younger sister in spite of all this tumbling down hills. Miss Marianne must not expect to have all the men to herself. Brandon will be jealous if she does not take care. I do not believe, said Mrs. Dashwood with a good-humoured smile, that Mr. Willoughby will be incommoded by the attempts of either of my daughters towards what you call catching him. It is not an employment to which they have been brought up. Men are very safe with us. Let them be ever so rich. I am glad to find, however, from what you say, that he is a respectable young man, and one whose acquaintance will not be ineligible. He is as good a sort of fellow, I believe, as ever lived, repeated Sir John. I remember last Christmas, a little hop at the park, he danced from eight o'clock to four, without once sitting down. Did he indeed? cried Marianne with sparkling eyes. And with elegance? With spirit? Yes, and he was up again at eight to ride to covert. That is what I like. That is what a young man ought to be. Whatever his pursuits, his eagerness in them should know no moderation, and leave him no sense of fatigue. I, I, I see how it will be, said Sir John. I see how it will be. You will be setting your cap at him now, and never think of poor Brandon. That is an expression, Sir John, said Marianne warmly, which I particularly dislike. I abhor every commonplace phrase by which wit is intended, and setting one's cap at a man, or making a conquest, are the most odious of all. Their tendency is gross and illiberal, and if their construction could ever be deemed clever, time has long ago destroyed all its ingenuity. Sir John did not much understand this reproof, but he laughed as heartily as if he did, and then replied, Ay, you will make conquests enough, I dare say, one way or other. Poor Brandon. He is quite smitten already, and he is very well worth setting your cap at, I can tell you, in spite of all this tumbling about and spraining of ankles.